I'm somewhat apprehensive about releasing this video. Yes, I do end up making a pot I like, but the journey to get there was fraught with failure, anger, and reactions to both of those I'm frankly a bit embarrassed to release in a video. But I'm sure they're reactions we've all had in some way, shape, or form. It begins with me being rather excited to throw with some new porcelain that was just delivered. I ordered a whole range of porcelain and thought I'd begin with this. And again, I'm sort of apprehensive about discussing this clay. It's called Glacier, and this struggling climber who looks as if he's fighting for his life pretty much sums up my experience using this porcelain. Initially, I thought it was just me. I'm sure every potter here has experienced a day when their throwing just doesn't go according to plan. But when I shared on Instagram that I bought this porcelain and had a terrible day throwing with it, I received more than a dozen messages from people who thought the same. One person even told me that in their studio, they refer to this clay body as dirty porcelain. Anyway, I hope that foreshadows what's to come. But to begin with, I sliced off two arbitrary amounts of clay, one for the body of the jar and the other for the lid. I thoroughly spiral wedged the clay up, which helps to amalgamate the mass of clay and remove any pockets of air that might be inside. And even at this stage, I could feel that this porcelain felt different compared to the body I've previously been using. It's hard to describe, but it felt like it just didn't want to knit together. So, to begin with, and as generally goes when I'm working with porcelain, I throw a thick disc, which I'll dry out to leather hard, so I can attach MDF bats on top of it to throw on. This way, when the pots are finished, I can just lift away the MDF platform the pot has been thrown on without having to touch the actual pot itself. And yes, I could use a throwing bat system to do this, or use bats with pins that slot onto the wheel head, but this is the way I was taught. It's not perfect, but it is versatile, and with a bit of practice and the right technique, it's easy to get bats stuck down really securely. I then dampen a patch of the MDF, not enough to soak it or to make the surface slippery, just enough so a lump of clay will stick securely to it. I fling the porcelain against it and then begin the centering process. And my aim here is to get the clay spinning as centrally on the wheel head as can be. That's explaining it very briefly, and I've previously made a much more in-depth video all about it in my beginner's guide, which I'll leave a link to on screen now and in the video description below. Once the lump of porcelain has been centered, I open it up and form the internal base, and I already felt as if this clay was slightly unruly. What I mean by this is that you get very used to throwing with certain types of clay. You expect it to behave in a certain way when you press against it, whereas this just felt slippery and not nearly as plastic and workable as compared to the Audrey Blackman porcelain I normally throw with. My aim for this morning was to throw about a dozen lidded containers of various shape and size, and film a video of me successfully doing that. The clay pulled up nicely for the most part, and when throwing with porcelain I've been using these mud tool sponges, as they really help me push in more consistently and have more control when lifting the clay up, but I already felt, even after just two pulls, as if these porcelain walls just wanted to crumple, and despite the walls being rather thick towards the base, you can see here that they're already twisting, like they do when they're thrown very thinly, so I collared the cylinder in quite aggressively, at least that's something this clay seems to be able to handle. In all likelihood, despite my negative experience with this clay body, I'm sure it would just take a lot of practice getting used to it in order to throw it successfully. It was this moment, when I pushed my hand inside the pot to begin shaping it, that the walls felt as if they lost all strength, and you can see just how drastically the height of the pot dropped. I didn't feel I'd be able to get much height back out of this, so I started the shaping process, which I do by pushing the clay out from the inside against the rib on the outside, and you can already see the pot here wobble and lose shape. The entire process of throwing this jar felt like a struggle, and this becomes infuriating so quickly, especially if you've just had a few good days making. Then, all of a sudden, nothing seems to work. Everything is uneven and undulating, and suddenly something you think you're quite good at comes to bite you and defy your expectations. At this point, I knew I wasn't going to be able to throw a perfect jar, but I do know I'll be able to rectify it during the trimming stage, after this terribly thrown pot has been allowed to dry out for a day or two. 
The one thing I love about porcelain is just how fine and sharp you can get the edges without all those particles of clay that usually reside in the stoneware I use getting in the way and making the edges gritty. I then measured the opening and tightly secured those calipers and then pried the bat off with the jar on top of it. Next, I'll throw the lid. And to begin with, I use a second pair of calipers to measure those I'd already set, as when throwing the lid, I have to measure the locating flange from the outside rather than from the inside. The lid itself is much faster to throw, as there's really no need to pull the clay up. These are sort of just like making tiny plates, with the most important thing being how accurately you throw the locating flange in order to fit the jar it's made for. I create a shallow well and then separate the thicker outer wall into two parts. The wall that projects upwards will be the part that slots into the pot, whereas the horizontal part will protrude over the rim of the jar, holding it aloft. With my set calipers, I measure the corner in between these two planes. And once it fits, I can proceed to clean up the lid by scraping the slip off all the flat sections. I tidy up the outside, and I try when throwing on bats to always scrape the slip off the exposed MDF, as they're easier to tidy up at this stage as compared to when all that clay dries, whereupon scraping it off will create a lot of dust. These were the only successful things I made in about a dozen attempts, as when trying to throw thinly with this stuff and make the shapes I'm accustomed to, with sharp edges and angles and narrow feet, just nothing seemed to work, all of which was exacerbated by the fact that every two seconds I was having to get off the wheel to clean my hands in order to move my camera. And eventually, I just totally lost it and called it a day. And don't you dare comment about all that porcelain that splashed everywhere. I kept finding dry splashes of porcelain for days afterwards, and I am not proud of my reaction. But throwing can be a frustrating experience, and these days it's extremely rare that I have days that go this poorly. But it does still happen, and when it does, I simply move on to a job that I know I can do successfully, like taking photographs for my social media, or throwing very simple stoneware mugs and bowls, pots I've made tens of thousands of and barely have to think about when producing them. This is now a few days later, I let both components dry on their MDF bats and then wired them off. And in the drying process, I think I left both parts to dry unevenly at some stage, as both have seemed to develop an undulation on one side, which can happen when one side of a pot dries out faster than the other, as if things couldn't get any worse. To attach the jar to the wheel, I brush some water over its base, place it down onto the metal and tap center it. The water, clay and friction all work together and help the pot stick firmly down. This way I can trim the entirety of the walls without any pieces of clay getting in the way. And just look at this mess. This is an impressively asymmetric pot, but with a bit of trimming I'll definitely be able to improve this. I begin by leveling out the rim, which I do by holding the trimming tool very steadily and only turning away the highest point that spins around. I can then move on to the walls and I'll continue with the same practice of only turning away the highest point that spins around until the wall is level. The one thing I love about porcelain, and even with this clay, despite it being hell to throw, it's lovely to trim, as the leather hard clay carves away in such beautiful ribbons, and it's a task made all the more enjoyable when using these surgically sharp trimming tools, made by my friend Jay Jun Lee, a supremely talented potter and toolmaker who works in Cardiff in Wales. He doesn't sell these tools all the time, but I will leave a link to his Instagram in the video's description, and I urge you to check his work out, as what he does with porcelain is frankly mesmerising. Anyhow, back to this pot, compared to how it was spinning a moment ago, the upper section is spinning a lot more true now, and it's a good thing I threw this thing relatively thick, as it means there's enough material to work with in order to trim it back and correct any irregularities. And this technique is actually one you'll see quite a lot of Korean makers utilising, especially those who work with porcelain. They throw thick and then trim back, as when working with a material that can be quite troublesome to throw with, it's just safer to throw on the thick side and then trim the excess away. For the lower section of the pot, I switched to one of my very sharp bison turning tools, as I find it a bit easier to control, and as I can focus the pressure on such a small point, I can remove a lot of material whilst remaining in control. And you can see how I'm holding this trimmer really tightly with two hands, 
to ensure that the blade stays in a nice steady line as I move it up and down, removing any slight undulation until the form is spinning true, whereupon I can relax my grip. After the shape has been corrected, I can switch to a larger, straighter blade, which helps me trim this section to be nice and straight, from the sharp angle around the waist to the foot. As the base becomes narrower, I'm essentially removing part of the pot that was holding it onto the wheel, so as I do this, I'm more cautious and hold the pot with my left hand, so it's there ready to catch the vessel at a moment's notice, if it does come loose and fly off the wheel. When trimming pots, I like to spin the wheel quickly, as it leaves me with a more even surface. This is because the pressure you apply to the pot with the blade is applied to the entirety of the outside, whereas if you trim with the wheel spinning very slowly, it's harder to keep the amount you remove from the walls even, and you may inadvertently trim one side thinner than the other, or take a big gouge out. Here's how thin some of these sections are, and translucency is one of the brilliant things about porcelain, and it can feel at times, especially once fired, more akin to glass than it does clay. To trim the lid, I simply placed it atop the vessel, and with a spinner tool placed on top, I firmly pushed down, as if the tool were to catch just a tiny bit. The lid could leap up and out, so the spinner helps to prevent that. I then trim the top of the lid, but I'm still applying quite considerable downward pressure with either my fingertips or the blade itself, and on this part of the pot I'll trim a very slight hollow, which hopefully will allow the glaze to pool into this section to create some visual interest, although there's another part of me that only wants to glaze the inside and leave the outside bare, which I'll then polish and sand so it's simply pure and white and matte in appearance, yet at the same time I know that issues can arise when you glaze only the outside or the inside, as it creates a tension between the exterior and the interior that can lead to cracks forming in the pot, but there's only one way to find out. The lid ended up taking some time to finish, as I wasn't entirely happy with its thickness and the way it undulated on the outside, but eventually I got it to a point that was acceptable. I always finish the lip of the jar after I've done the lid, as trimming this section nice and thin removes mass that previously would have helped support the lid. And in a few cases when trimming stoneware pots like this in the past, where I trimmed this lip section before the lid, I ended up breaking a number of pots, as the pressure I pushed down with on the lid itself was enough to cause the clay underneath to buckle and collapse. So now I do it this way around. I then place the pot upside down on its lid, and I lightly tap centre the lid section until the base of the pot spins perfectly in the middle of the wheel, and to secure it all in place, I press three lumps of soft porcelain around the lid to make sure it doesn't slide off centre. I could see that the lower section of wall was bowing outwards a tiny bit, so I trimmed this bulge away to make sure it was completely straight, and once again as I work, I'm pushing down firmly from above with the spinner because as there's nothing actually holding the jar in place other than the flange on the tightly fitting lid, it does have a bit of a tendency to want to leap out of place, so this downward pressure is crucial. One of the best things about Jay and Lee's tools is the beautifully smooth surface they leave, so when working with porcelain, I often use this tool for a final pass. I'll finish this base simply by trimming it flat and then turning a beveled edge around the outside. This very slight bevel makes the pot feel as if it's floating ever so slightly on whatever surface it is you place it on, as the pot will cast a very slight shadow underneath itself, which again gives the pot a visual sense of lightness. It also creates a point of contact that's less likely to chip with use, and you can clearly see the band of shadow underneath the pot I was speaking about here. If I didn't trim the beveled edge at the bottom, the pot would look as if it connected to the table, and visually it just makes the pot appear slightly more heavy. Anyhow, I'm surprised how well this turned out, considering how terribly it was thrown, and I just love this matte white finish, so let me know how you think I should glaze this. Thanks so much for watching this somewhat traumatic experience. I think I'll be saving this clay for flat vessels, like plates and bowls, if I do indeed dare throw with it again. And I'll see you, as always, next week.